The Dice Tower, episode 635. Underrated Games. I'm confused. Are you saying he's an underrated actor? I, I, I'm saying he's a very strong uh, a solid character actor that, that is often forgotten. And, and I, I think uh, that, that we should remember Tony Shalhoub. Remember Stark Raving Mad? That was a fantastic sitcom that everyone just forgot. Wasn't he on Wings? Yes. Yes, he was. Yeah, that's all I know is Wings and Monk and... <laughs> I don't well, think he's, he's on underrated. The, uh, the fabulous Mrs. Maisel. I, I mean, oh yeah, that's I think true. Yeah, he just shows up in places. You're like, you know what? He's amazing. <laughs> I don't think. Okay, great. Well, folks, welcome to the first podcast of the Dice Tower of December 2019. Oh my goodness, I don't remember giving anyone permission for December to start. Yeah. I, I'm not ready for December. That's because it's they have like Christmas programs and all kinds of stuff for school. Oh, boy. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, technically, this is where people always argue. Every 10 years, the same argument happens. Oh. Technically, uh, it's not uh, the end of a decade. And yes. yet, it is. Because who cares? Right, yeah. I mean, everyone's talking. It, it's when the, the number changes. So, you know, the third number in the date is changing. So that's got to be the end of something, right? So, yes, rules lawyers, we know that 2021 is technically the start of a new decade. Right. But since they weren't doing best of in the year 10, <laughs> we've only started doing this stuff recently, and it's more fun to do it this way. Yeah. And this was even a bigger deal when the year 2000 came. People were like, well, technically, I'm like, shut up. It's, yeah, no, it's, yeah. it's a new millennial. Yeah. <laughs> so the decade is almost over. Eric's been on the podcast for a decade. Oh, wow. Uh, yes. And we may do some decade retrospective stuff, but we're not doing that today. Not and today. now we're getting ready to go to PAX, actually. Yeah. I'm excited. So, so PAX Unplugged, if you're in the Philadelphia area, please stop by our booth. I'll be there. Eric will be there. Sam will be there. Z will be there. Uh, Roy, Kenny, many of the contributors to the Dice Tower will be there. You definitely want to come by and see Sam, though, because this is his last major convention with the Dice Tower. Indeed. Yeah, so Sam Healy, who was a co-host on the Dice Tower uh, mm -hmm. long, uh, well, over a decade ago. <laughs> Indeed, yes. <laughs> has been with us on video, but due to family issues, has had to relocate, and so is heading up to Washington. Wow. You will still likely see him, A, on the Dice Tower in a limited fashion in the future, probably, and you will see him in the board game industry in a less than limited fashion. I'll let him announce all that when that's all finalized. Mysterious. Yeah. So if you're coming to PAX, make sure you stop by our top 10 there because it will be the last live show top 10 that we'll be doing with Sam for some time. Mm. Then after that, we go to a new year. The Dice Tower Kickstarter is coming. I got some really cool promos coming for that. I'm excited about that. We have some new things. We'll be talking about new things that we're doing with the Dice Tower. Uh, I have uh, – we got the Dice Tower Cruise. That is essentially yes. sold out at this point. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but there's still tickets for Dice Tower West. Not many. I mean that is essentially sold out. There's a few tickets left for Dice Tower West. And plenty of tickets left for Dice Tower East still, though, in Orlando. So check out Dice Tower West or DiceTowerEast.com. You know who's coming to Dice Tower West? Well, I mean, other than lots of people. But specifically, my little brother is coming to Dice Tower West. I'm well, I need to clarify before I, I look for some young chap. Is he, is he little or is he bigger than you? No, he's actually significantly taller than I am. He's, uh, ah, then I'll get yeah. along with him fine because tall people are better than shorter people. He may be taller than you. I'm not sure. I'll just assume he is. It's, or you're very close in height. It, it, it's going to be interesting. Is he nice? Yes, he's quite nice. Well, I don't know. I haven't met a, a, a nice summerer yet. You're, you're, you're thinking, wait, what? <laughs> That's not even a good joke because <laughs> your wife is quite nice and your kids are nice. <laughs> yes. Wait, wait you're, you're still, never mind. <laughs> I don't think I met your parents, have I? <laughs> no, I don't think so. 
Yeah, so, okay. Anyhow, <laughs> how was your Thanksgiving? Mine was lovely. Uh, I got to spend a lot of time with family, my nice parents and nice siblings. Uh, I actually just <laughs> got back. I got back from Maine. We drove up to Maine for one day. Uh, and, and driving back from Maine in a snowstorm on the day after the Thanksgiving weekend is not fun. Just want to point that out. But I had a lovely time. We played some games uh, and, and just had some great family togetherness. It was a good time. How about you? Yes, for the, I think, fourth or fifth uh, Thanksgiving in a row, did not play any games. Uh, what? Which seems weird, but yeah, I, I think it's because I wake up at six. I started cooking all the way up till two. So I was like eight straight hours of cooking. Okay. And then everyone ate the meal. And then we served pies because, you know, of course. And then when we were done with pies, then we cleaned up. And after that point, I'm just not ready to game. <laughs> but I, do sure. always, I, I did do Black Friday gaming. Yep. And which is my new monthly game meetup now that I'm running where I made a great On oath. Black Friday? Well, no. It just, it's on a Friday once a month. This time happened oh, Black okay. Friday. But it's a new meetup that I do where I promise everybody that I will only bring games I know how to play already. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I know. It's weird. But what it does <laughs> is it makes me play games that, I, that are older sometimes. Well, they're not necessarily always older. They could be a new game I already know how to play. Right. Or an older game, you know. And so it's kind of interesting to me because I'm playing these games, you know, that I know how to play. But then... The day nice. after Black Friday, Black Saturday, <laughs> I we had our monthly game meetup. So then I went and played a whole lot of new games. So okay, lots of cool stuff. Yeah. All righty. Well, Thanksgiving being over, it's time to talk about some games. And boy, do we have some games to talk about today? I'm gonna start with Eric because okay. I have played none of his games. Oh, exciting. Then, uh, well, we're going to talk about Brussels 1897, which was a game that confused Tom when he saw it on the list of Essen games because he was like, there's already been a Brussels game. That's because there was. Uh, Brussels 1893 was a board game that came out a few years ago. Uh, 1897 is the card game version of 1893. Um, it's from Geek Attitude Games. The designer is uh, Etienne Esperman. Uh, I haven't met Etienne Esperman. Brussels 1897 is, um, well, you've got the, this big tableau of cards that, that represent buildings and uh, pieces of art and, um, and the materials to build those buildings, as well as uh, the opportunity to sell those pieces of art. And they're all in a big grid. Uh, and on your turn, you're going to place one of your workers. This is a worker placement game that's in the, the guise of a card game. And you're going to place one of your workers on this grid. Uh, but you can you have like two different strengths of workers. Your workers are, are represented by cards that you also have. And you can, say, put it on, on one side that's only worth one point, And the other side, which might be worth three or four or even five. In order to do that, you have to pay for whatever the number is on the card. So if I want to put the stronger worker out, I need to pay four, five, three coins in order to do that. But I can put out the cheap worker, too. Uh, this is important because not only am I getting uh, the materials that I'm going to use to build a building or, uh, or the art piece or whatever it is I'm claiming on this board, but there's also majorities in the columns that we're, we're going for here. And at the end of the round, whoever has the largest strength in a particular column also gets bonuses like gaining strength on the, uh, the prestige track or uh, the ability to break out one of their people from prison because I didn't get to that. Uh, there's, there's special actions, uh, that, that are always available every round that if you do more of that than anybody else, you are going to send one of your people to jail. Like you, you've spent too much time manipulating in government and you're going to send one of your people to jail. Uh, so you can get, break those people out and you play over, I think it's four rounds, uh, to, to earn points with, uh, holding exhibitions for your art and uh, selling that art to earn money. Uh, but it's the, it's basically the same mechanisms as, uh, 1893, the board game version with a little bit less of a, like a, well, board element. That makes sense. Uh, yes, but it's this, this would usually the card game versions of board games end up being a, a lighter 
version. This is not necessarily the case with Brussels 1897. This is just as deep, I think, as the board game. Um, has many of the same decisions, but has streamlined the components because everything is represented by cards and just a couple of uh, player markers. I, I did enjoy it, but it is a deeper game than I expected it to be. Um, it, it plays, what do they say on the box? I have the box here. Um, it, no way. It says 45 to 60 minutes. That did not happen. No. <laughs> I, well, that's your play group. I, yeah, you're, okay, so my play group is inclined to go a little longer, but still, just working your way through the, I, I think it's at least 90. Um, it's 45 to 60 seems really short. You'd have to really be flying through in order to do that. But anyway, enjoyed it. Um, and, and if you maybe played Brussels 1893 and didn't get a chance to get a copy, this is a lovely replacement. I did not get 1893 and, and did enjoy playing it at conventions and stuff like that. So um, I'm glad I picked up 1897, and I'm hoping it sees some more table time. I'm only talking about good games in today's episode. Oh, my goodness. No, no, no. That wasn't a disparaging remark about yours. <laughs> oh, okay. I meant, I'm not saying anything bad about games, I think. Okay. Let me look. Well, at least for now, I, I think. Okay. Well, we'll see. I'm starting with Maracaibo. This was probably the hottest new game at Essen, if there was such a thing. I saw a lot of people carrying this one around at, at Spiel, yeah. Yeah, there was no clear hottest game, for sure. Um, but this one, a lot of people want to play because it's the newest, uh, the newest Fister, Alexander Fister game. So in Maracaibo, you themingly, themingly theme stuff, which is a lie, as is all of his <laughs> games. But you're uh -huh. in the Caribbean, basically jumping from island to island, which I noticed like almost every island on the board was the name of another game. But anyhow. Uh -huh. In Cute. this game, you're trying to get points through various ways, and you're going to be on your turn moving a ship one to seven spaces, and where you land, you can then take actions. Based on where you land, you can deliver goods using cards from your hands. You can uh, take specific actions where you are trying to help Spain, English, and uh, France conquer areas or control s different colonies in the Mediterranean, and you can send out your explorer, and you're doing all these different things to get points. And I know that I'm, I'm, that sounds disparaging, but that's really what the game is. The game is about playing these cards from your hands. There's a big deck of cards, and there's this card management system, and you're trying to play these cards in front of you. And as you get these cards in front of you, they give you special abilities. They increase your money income and point income between rounds. But it's all about moving these ships, and it's about upgrading your own ship. So you have this big ship in front of you, and on it you have these little stacks of wooden discs. And when, whenever you deliver a good, you can take a wooden disc off one of these stacks. Just remove it. Uh, and other special abilities will let you do that. When you remove two wooden discs, you now have an, a special ability. So maybe instead of having a hand of four cards, you now get have six cards. Uh, when you draw cards, you can draw them from the face-up display. You have a new action you can take when you go to villages. Uh, mm. Things like that. Uh, maybe one just, you take the two discs off and it gives you five gold. Now, I will say stacking two little discs. These are the exact discs that you would have found, the little brown discs from Puerto Rico. Stacking, mm. I think, maybe 15 stacks of two on your player sheet. Really annoying. Wow. It only takes a little bit of a jitter and they fall over. This is where a, an overlay board, I think, would have been pretty useful. But despite that, I really enjoy it. It definitely will give you vibes of his other games, especially Great Western Trail. There's some similarities to that. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, Mombasa in there, too. I like it better than his other games. Remember, I'm not a huge Alexander Pfister fan, but I like his games well enough. And I think mm -hmm. I like this one the best. The only thing I don't like about this game is it comes with this whole story legacy nonsense. I mean, serious, just a, 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 a big who cares from me. Because there's a card. I mean, you play this game and there's this huge deck of cards and you go through these cards and every game's going to be different. I don't need to play through a storyline where we'll add a new city to the board that people can go visit. I'm, I don't got time to play the same group, the same game. I want to play this... I've played Maracaibo multiple times now with a different group each time. You know, I don't, this is not, stop campaigning games that don't need to be campaigned. 
And it also has a whole okay. bunch of extra pieces that I put in a bag and like, eh, I guess I'll get to those some other time. But you don't even uh -huh. need to do that. I mean, I literally don't even feel like curiosity about this. I think there's a ton in the base game as it is. So I could easily say if you like Alexander Fister games, you'll like Maracaibo. I think it will not reach the renowns of Great Western Trail. That's, I think, in the top 10 games at Be Board Game Geek. If oh, not, wow. it's very, very popular. Okay. I don't think it'll be that popular, but this might rise to be his second most popular. I could, I would not be surprised at that. I do enjoy it. So Maracaibo. Cool. Uh, next for me is a game that, uh, that I had played briefly uh, with friends at Dice Tower West um, and grabbed a copy while I was in Germany. It's uh, not available in, in uh, outside of Ooh. Germany. It's called Belrati. Uh, or Bell Roddy, but I think it's Bell Roddy because the uh, the evil character is a rat. Uh, he is an art forger. Um, this is from Repost Productions, and Michael Loth is the the name of the designer. A cooperative game about trying to uncover the forgeries of this Bell Roddy character. Um, some of you uh, on on a particular round are going to be playing Owl. Uh, that's the artist that will be submitting art pieces for a particular uh, exhibition. And the rest of the team is playing Cat, which is the art manager. Um, in a round, you will ask for a certain number of art pieces um, from two to seven. And the more you ask for, the more potential points you might earn in that particular round. Once you know how many pieces of art you need, uh, you will also reveal um, two pieces of art. Uh, there's this huge deck of just art, um, just pictures with various objects on them and you'll reveal two um, so you might end up with a old rotary, rotary telephone and a cup of tea and now owl must uh, if you ask for four pieces of art the owl players must collectively submit four pieces of art that fit one or the other of those themes then you take four cards from the top of the deck. Those are Bell Ratty's forgeries. You shuffle them all up, flip them all up, and now the cat players need to decide which ones were the ones submitted by the players and which of the two exhibitions they belong to. This really uh, sounds you, like a party game. It, it is a little party-ish. We're, we're going to discuss that later. You're going to have us here, Tom. Um, but yeah, there's, there, this is certainly a light-ish game. Um, and if you if you succeed in matching uh, a player submitted card to the correct exhibition, you're going to earn a point. Uh, if you name a player submitted card but get it in the wrong exhibition, nothing bad happens. It's just it's a zero. It's a null move. But if Bell Ratty gets one of his cards into the exhibition, that's a negative point. And as soon as Bell Ratty gets six negative points, the game is over. And hopefully you've achieved 15 positive points in order to quote unquote win the game. But there's a scale where you could do better or worse than that based on how many points you get. There are some special powers that you can, you know, ask about a specific piece of art or swap out the themes or swap out the hand of cards. If you're one of the owl players um, that then can't be reactivated unless you get a perfect round. Um, but you continue like this until Bell Ratty succeeds in getting enough forgeries in there. I played this with the family while we were together for Thanksgiving, and um, it fell flat. This one did not succeed with my family. And you made it uh, sound interesting, although this this cover looks horrific. It's it's got a distinctive art style for sure. It looks like a warthog. It it's it's a, a little bit of a warthog. It's a, it's a mustache, not a warthog. It's a it's a rat with a mustache. Warthog. Anyway. Um, so the, the real issue that my family had with this game is you don't know, well, obviously you don't know what Bell Ratty is throwing into the pile, but sometimes Bell Ratty throws in the perfect card for a particular theme just through the luck of the draw. And there's really no, and then other times you're forced to play like a, a fourth card when nobody has a really good match uh, for, for all four of those cards. And when those things mix, it's very hard to stay ahead of the rat and it, they just felt frustrated not being able to play to the ability. You know, they just didn't feel like they had a lot of control. Can't you just um, cut the rat out? It, no, the scoring, I mean. Oh, and, and but then what would the end game be? Who cares? Just play I, until you get a certain number of points. I, I guess, but I think that would ruin the... I think that the, what, what drew me to it is that it was cooperative playing against the game and trying to defeat the, the random enemy. Um, 
but I guess you could play it that way. That would make it more of a know. party game. You're, you're the one I, complaining about it. I am. I So in comparison, there's a game from uh, Horrible Games called Similo that Tom and you, you and I played uh, at dinner one day. Um, that, oh, yeah, that is, I like this game. Yeah, it, it, you, you put out an array of cards, and the, the active player is trying to get everybody to guess, say, Peter Pan out of an array of fairy tale characters. And they do that by playing cards that either match or not match the card that you're trying to get them to guess. And they eliminate a certain number each round of the game. It plays very quickly and has a similar feel to this, although it's so much simpler. Belratti has, there's there's all this extra stuff of how many uh, paintings do you ask for on a turn and how do you reactivate your special powers. And Similo just was like, guess Peter Pan. You know, just... It's very focused and simple and straightforward, and my family liked that one significantly better than Bell Ratty. So I, I'm i not sure if this one's going to stick around in the collection, which is a shame after going through such trouble to get it. But anyway, Bell Ratty from Repost Productions. Well, if you remember, there was a, a day where I may have uh, uh, thrown a game off a roof. Just once? Huh? <laughs> Just one time? Well, yeah. I, actually, have I thrown two games off a roof? Were they different I roofs? I don't remember. Well, anyway, the game was uh, Marco... Uh, Marco po No, not Marco Polo. Now I'm getting all mixed up. The Voyages of Vasco da Gama. Yes. Well, I now have played another game from the same designer, Paul Amore. I've played many games of his, and as the years yeah. have gone by, I've really enjoyed his games. You yeah. know, I, I I found them to be just entertaining as all get out. And I just played one of his games from PSC games called Blitzkrieg. Hmm. It's a World War II in 20 minutes, it's called. Now, I don't think that... I, I need to pause the audio here for a second. Sure. Why is this not working? One moment. Oh, I know what the problem is. Stupid Macintosh. Okay, we can go back. Yep. So Blitzkrieg here, which is a, a two-player game, and it's it, it basically says it's World War II in 20 minutes. I don't believe that for a second. I didn't believe it. Whatever. I'm not... You know, I like war games, okay, but so I played this and it is fantastic. Like one of the best games of the year, fantastic. Wow. Essentially, it reminds me a lot of another two player game that I really enjoy called Watergate. Um, so okay. Blitzkrieg has different uh, areas of operation. So, like you have Europe and Asia and Southeast Asia, et cetera, Africa, whatever. And different places that you can play tokens. You have a bag of tokens that are uh, air units, land units, and sea units. So you draw three tokens. You have them behind a shield. And then you play a unit in whichever theater you want to in an open spot. You can play sea units in blue spaces, land units in brown spaces, and air units can go in either space. When you play a unit, you move a token that's at the top of each of these a little bit to your side. When a whole row gets filled up in one of these areas... Uh, then you get points equal to that row if it's on your side. So if it's closer to the, the German side and we've finished the top row of tokens in the Europe side, I might get three points, for example. If I get it really far to my side, like let's say Eric says, I'm not going to even fight you for Europe. I'll get extra points the farther the token moves to more, my side. As I score mm. each, each of the time that I fill another row, I'll get more points. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, so you, you can't let someone just have one of these arenas. So you're fighting back and forth for these different arenas. But there's more to it than that. Some of the spaces, when you put a token on them, they'll give you a bonus. Some, if you put a token on it, it will give you victory points. Some, when you put a token on it, it makes that token more powerful. It might say three. So you might put down a tank that's two, but it's actually a five. So you move the token five spaces towards your side. Some will give you factories, which will let you draw an extra token from the bag. So now I have four tokens to choose from. 
Some let you bomb your opponent, making them discard one of their tokens from behind their screen, which now means they only have two tokens to draw from. If you make them get rid of all their tokens, they'll lose the game. Hmm. So you got to be careful because you draw only draw one token at the end of your turn. Some tokens are research, and then you draw a token from another random pile of tokens that gives you really cool units that you throw into your bag and hope you draw to use later on. It's phenomenally cool. It is only 20 minutes. It's a nice back and forth thing. And for people like Eric, there's even an expansion. The Nippon expansion uh, <laughs> is a what if scenario if Japan had conquered America and they're fighting back and forth. Also, Godzilla's in it. Well, okay. See, now you're more interested. I am. <laughs> but it actually essentially... sounds like a, a bag building Twilight struggle. Yeah, the bag building part isn't. I mean, yes, you, you'll you throw a few extra in there, right? It's not a huge deal. Like, there's one that's uh, it's a, it's a, a nuke or an atomic bomb. And when that token comes out, it's a six for your side, which is pretty powerful. But then you also go down two in every other arena. Ooh. Yeah, so there's some neat stuff like that. You know, there's leaders who give you a point for every token that you already have in an area. And yes, it's very similar to Twilight Struggle, except it's 20 minutes. So the war theme is there, although you don't see units die or anything. It's just a race. The first team to get to 25 victory points wins, period. Hmm. Well, if the German player gets there, since the German player goes first, the U.S. player has one last turn. You know, but I really, really like this game. It is absolutely fantastic. So it's that's a Blitzkrieg. A poor name, actually, I think. Since if you search for Blitzkrieg on the internet, you're going to find a lot of games. But A lot of games, yeah. But it's a, a really good one. So check it out. Cool. Uh, my last game also plays in about 20 minutes, 20 to 30 maybe. It's called Roll Estate. This is a, uh, a print-and-play game. It's only $3 on PNP Arcade. It's designed by Chris Michaud, who was the uh, moderator of Flip the Table, a uh, proud member of the Dice Tower Network. It is. It was designed as a combination of Yahtzee and Monopoly, um, and it, it. I think it. It follows through on that. This is a roll and write. You game. should mention that Chris is the biggest Monopoly defender amongst people who like the the games that we tend to play. I yes, he does definitely. He he purchased the new Monopoly game, uh, the longest game ever, totally unironically, and plans to play it. Oh, um, I also purchased it, but it was not totally unironically. <laughs> it was so that I can destroy it. I see. Uh, so roll estate uh, uses the Yahtzee mechanism. You have five dice uh, and you will you roll them, get two re-rolls. You can keep whichever dice you want. Once you're happy with the dice or you've rolled your three, you will then mark down something on your sheet. And the sheet is, is split up into uh, properties. Um, say you got three threes, uh, and you want to score for threes. You'd write down nine in one of the boxes for threes, but you can place it. There's each, each number has either two or three slots, houses, basically. And you can start in any one of the positions. But if I put a nine down in, say, the second slot, I need to put a lower total in the first slot and a higher total in the third slot. That makes sense. But I could start sure. with the, the three in the uh, or the nine in the third slot. And then I need to put a six and a three in the first and second slots. If I manage to complete the entire row, uh, each of these is also worth points at the end of the game. But if I manage to complete a row, I get to open a business. If I'm the first one to to complete that row, I get to open the, the best business in that that block. And many of them also have a second place. If you're the second one to complete that row, you will get a, a smaller, less lucrative business. But still a bonus at the end of the game. Uh, you can also, uh, the, the railroads are how you, uh, you get straights in order to get the railroads. So if you get the one through four straight, that's one railroad. Then the two through five is a different railroad. The three through six is a different railroad. There's also a fourth railroad that is any straight. If you manage to get a straight of five, um, that allows you to multiply your, uh, Yahtzee has a chance, uh, option. This is just the total of all of the dice. But if you get a straight, you can multiply that chance value by five or even 10 if you get a second one of those. If you get a Yahtzee, all five of the same numbers, that's a bonus. Um, but what what makes this work 
is the race for these different uh, um, bonuses. It has a little bit of a um, roll through the ages feel to it as you build toward things and you're watching what the other players are building towards and maybe try and beat them to it with your different die results. Um, and the game continues uh, until somebody has three different businesses, that's the bonuses for completing the rows in the in the real estate, or uh, somebody can't place uh, one of the houses, can't, can't buy any more real estate. It, it happens really fast, um, and sometimes when you're least expecting it, uh, can can end very quickly. But this one's seen uh, multiple plays. Every time I've played it so far, it's like, let's do that again. I really want to do that again. And I, I think it really works as a a light roll and write, um, simple to understand, especially if you're familiar with Yahtzee and or Monopoly. Um, and and I think it does what it set out to do. It's a combination of those two games that that embraces the love of both. Roll Estate from Chris Show. It's on uh, PNP Arcade. PNP. Uh, I don't and, uh, think you've sold me on it, but no. It, 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 I like it. I think it's 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 inexpensive for sure, and uh, it's. Oh, that's uh, true. 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 Yeah. It it it's it's an easy portable game, and everybody's got five dice. Okay, I am not a victim of hype very easily. In fact, ah. hype usually makes me go the other way mm -hmm. you know tapestry had an immense amount of hype the mind had a lot of hype so on well i'm telling you about a game now that definitely i'm seeing the undercurrents of hype and i promise you this game will be one of the biggest hype games of next year just going to be okay i'm making the call now sure and it's called the crew the quest for planet nine it's currently only out in german die crew mm -hmm. uh but it will be out it's being published by Thames and Cosmos, and so it will be out next spring from them. Which isn't that far away, now come to think of it. No, <laughs> not really. Time moves pretty quickly here. After I played this game, I instantly bought it from Germany because mm. I want to play it more now. Have you heard about this one, Eric? I have. This, this was getting a lot of buzz at Essen. Uh, I did not make it over there to buy a German copy. Uh, but I, I did request, after hearing about it, uh, our, our contact at Thames and Cosmos and said, when you've got review copies available of the crew, I'd really like to see that one. So um, I will wait patiently rather than um, buy a German copy. So what this game is, folks, is it's a cooperative trick-taking game. It has multiple missions. I think there's 50 missions in it, but let's just talk about mission one. Okay. So it's a deck uh, of... 40 cards that you have. There's uh, 36 cards, one through nine of four different suits. And then there's four cards numbered one through four, and that suit is just Trump. So it's a typical trick-taking game. If Eric leads, a f if he plays a five blue, everyone else at the table in turn order also must play a blue card. If they don't have a blue card, they can play any color they want. Mm -hmm. Whoever plays the highest card of the, whoever, the card that the person played first, the color that was led, will win that trick. And that's what it's called. One, Everyone plays one card. That's a trick. And then that person plays the next card of the next trick. If someone plays a trump card, they will win the trick automatically or the highest trick card. So the four trump card will always win a trick in this game. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, it's that's a pretty standard trick-taking game. If you play these pretty before, standard. you kind of know how that works. Yep. But what this game does is it comes with two other decks, or uh, just one other deck of cards, and then a book of missions. Well, so mission one says, take this other deck, which has 36 cards, and you shuffle it, you draw one. And whoever has the four trump must say they're going first. So if, if we're playing a four-player game, Eric draws the four trump card, he goes first. So then we'll draw a card from this little deck, and it will say the blue six. That means Eric must take the blue six over the course of this game. If he does so, we win. Okay. Here's the other thing, though. We can't talk. <laughs> okay, that's the modern trend in gaming. But we can communicate. Each person may show one card from their hand over the course of a round, and they may put a token on that card. If you put the token at the top of the card, you're telling everyone that's the highest card you have of that color. If you put it at the bottom, it's the lowest card you have of that color. And if you put it in the middle... It's the only card you have of that color. Hmm. So if Eric's trying to win the blue five, I might show that I have the blue five. And then I might tell people, that's the only blue card I have in my hand. 
All right, so now people are trying to get me to play other colors, maybe, so they can get me to slough off red, for example, until then someone can play a red card, and then I can play any card I want, and hopefully Eric plays the trump card at that point and wins, or something like mm. that. So this game is, and that's, that's mission one. Mission two will draw a card for the person who has trump four, and the person after that will get a card. Both of them have to take a card. Hmm. And then there's all kinds of crazy rules that will get added in there. And it's fascinating, especially if you're like me and you played a lot of trick-taking games in your life. Just that communing with everybody else, trying to think, okay, I need to play this card at this time. It's your responsibility to play this card here. And I'm not a huge fan of the mind. I, th I think it's an entertaining thing. But the mind, there's literally no – well, if you play it by the, the strictest of rules, there's no communication at all. Right. right? You're just supposed to – know when to play a card in this game every as far as i can tell every mission has a solution you have to play it the right way and you have to show the right card and give the right information mm -hmm. oh i love this game i mean i love this game uh i am actually just so that you don't think i'm being duplicitous here i'm considering this to be a 2020 game at this point. Sure. Because it's not out in English yet. So yeah, if yeah. you wonder why it's not on my best of the year lists, that's mm -hmm. why. Okay. But it would be. Hmm. That's how much I, I mean, I'm telling you, this game just fascinates me. Now, I will say this. If you've never played a trick-taking game at the table before, and you're playing with people who have played trick-taking games, they may throw their cards at you. That's true. Because... Those tricks and those tropes and the when to play the right card, that's something it's hard to teach, right? It's just something you yeah. learn by doing. Yeah, yeah. So you might struggle a little bit. I mean, you'll learn pretty quickly. It's not like you, you can't play the game. Right. But, wow. I did not think I would like it, and I do. Yeah, it's it's sort of like, you know, one of the things I enjoy playing, say, Teach You uh, or, or other trick-taking games that uh, – but but one of the things that I struggle with is that that meta game, the the strategy, the when do I make my move? When do I hold back and not try and win a trick? When do what what cards do I play now so that I still have something to play when I do right. gain the lead? And and this seems to be all that this is. It's a very simple trick taking game, but it's the strategy of making that specific move in order to achieve those goals um, that it seems fascinating. Now, one thing I will say negative about it, it does not necessarily scale well. A three-player game is going to be vastly easier than a five-player game mm. because you have more cards in your hand, therefore having more information. That's not a big deal, I think. You just play a harder mission, right? Right. I'm really glad. I met Mike Fitzgerald there, and he was raving about the game. And he said, well, when we play, I'm already up to like mission 27, so we'll just start there. And someone <laughs> else taught me the game. And they started on mission one, and I was like, I'm glad I didn't play with Mike. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have – I thought mission – I could play like, – like mission one is probably too easy, right? Once you know what you're doing, it's probably too easy. But I could sure. have played mission one like six games in a row and been happy. You know, it's it, it's just – it's it's not like, oh, we solved that mission. It's a different card each time. You know, and, and it depends who has what card. So it's – that's different. And then mission two has two cards and so on and so, so forth. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just – ah, so good. It's so good. That's The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine. Whew. All righty. Well, that's straightforward stuff. Let's jump to something that's not quite so straightforward. A little bendy. Ooh. Saving. All right. For those of you watching, look what I got. These are some – some. Uh, I, I, this is that board game Geek Con. And these you put on the corner of your game, and then you slide them in. Let me see if I have a game box here. Oh, so I do. Hey, it's Blitzkrieg. So you put it here, or you put the, the corner like this, and then you put this on. No, you put it this way. I'm putting it on the wrong way. No, I am putting it on the right way. Oh, 
You're supposed to have the box open because it fits around the inside of the box. There we go. So it's opened up. And then I put it like this. And I got to flip these open. And you're going to, then they'll slide down in the box. This one's actually a little too big for this box. This is for the ticket to ride size box. So then it's on like that. And it's supposed to protect your corner of the box. I don't know Wait, yet, what? folks. They're five dollars for a set. I don't have the money to pay for five dollars per game. They also don't look amazing, right? They look okay. And they're gonna take up more space on the shelf, I think. But but what you do now, I mean, I thought that that was to keep them together, like to keep the lid on. No, but no, that's no. Not what that does. It's just to protect the box. It's like putting tape on a box, right? So wow. the concept's interesting, you know, for those boxes that fall apart. I don't know. <laughs> the funny thing was, he had us. I, I said, eh, you know, let's talk. Maybe I'm interested in this. I don't know. So I wrote my name and phone number down to enter a raffle, and I got a text that said, you won a free one. I was like, oh, uh -huh. that's cool. Come by the booth and pick it up. So I was busy. I went by the next day. He's like, oh, I don't have any more. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And so I was like, oh, all right. He didn't even say, like, I'll send you one later. Just like. <laughs> just, just sorry. Too bad. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, well. All right. I'm ready with a quick comment on Jeff before we move into your uh, 18 games, if you want. Let's do it. So that explains why I have not uh, done as well at gaming as as I uh, I should. I've been I've been doing Euclidean moves, and what I should be doing is non-Euclidean moves. And I, I knew there was something wrong. My paradigm is just totally off. Well, all I'm saying is Euclid was an amazing person. I'm I'm not 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 uh, arguing that. Alrighty, folks. Well, we're gonna jump now. It's, I, I always feel around this time of year that we don't talk about enough games in the Dice Tower. We talk about, you know, we each talk about two or three yeah. an episode, and then I fall behind and don't talk about a lot of games. But I played a lot of games that came out at Essen and a little bit before Essen, so I thought I would go through them. And it's been a while since we've done Tom Does X Game in X Minutes. Yes. So what are we aiming for today, Tom? Well, I don't know. Let's see how long it takes me. But I want to make some rules here. Oh. First of all, Eric can also chime in if he's played the game. I tried to pick uh, games I don't think he's played. <laughs> no, there's there's only one on your list that I've played the original version of, but I have not played the new one. Oh, okay, I know that. Okay. Sure. And he can so he can chime in. He can even ask me questions and I got to keep going. I got <laughs> I got to answer the questions. Excellent. But he can't ask questions just to be a dork. Well, okay. Can, we can discuss later whether they're dorky questions or not. No, what I mean is you can't say, well, uh, by the way, what year was the designer born? Why would I do that? Just so that you don't complete it in time? <laughs> I thought this was a cooperative game. <laughs> Maybe it is. I don't know. It's not a game. There's no, there's no winner, no loser, but I, I'm going to win. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm ready. You got a okay. timer? Are you ready? Yes, I'm I do. Ready. I'm ready to go. Three, two, one. One, go. By the way, I'm doing these in alphabetical order, so we'll start with Age of Dirt. This is uh, from uh, WizKids. This is a game that I wanted to play because it has a love hut in it. Essentially, it also has a, a meeple tower. <laughs> and each turn, you have these little huts in the middle of the table and areas, and you drop little meeples in them. And, or you can take the lid off one and then take all the meeples in there, throw them in the tower, and the ones that come out the bottom, like a cube tower, they get to do that action. So there might be five guys in Love Hut. I need to throw them all in the tower. And if two of mine come out, I get another meeple. Hooray. It's hilarious. Silly fun. Uh, throwing. I like the cube tower. I like the I don't, It's a silly caveman style game. Get victory points and plays in a nice clean 45 minutes. Do you get to smack the cube tower with a club? You do. So if you have a hammer and your cube towers don't come out, you can hit it three times with a club trying to make yours fall out. Very, very cool. funny. Alubari is a game about making tea. This is from Tony Boydell, and if I guess correctly, this is a variation on Snowdonia. 
The only reason I mention this is because when I played it with people, they said, this is a lot like Snowdonia. So, <laughs> anywho, uh, Alubari is a game in which you are building a railroad track in India and also drinking tea a lot, I think. Uh, and so While you're you building? are Weird. taking turns, placing workers, activating these workers to get resources, use those resources to build trains and stations and clear rubble. And I really thought it was fantastic. I worry that it might, each of the games I've played has felt fairly similar, but there's some variation. I liked it enough, but I wonder about long-term replayability, but still fun. Art box. You roll four dice. They will show you lines and circles and squares and things like that. And then you have to use those to draw a picture. Everyone draws a picture, put them in the middle of the table. Then you have to guess what picture is what. I might say a toothbrush, and you're like, well, everyone had to use three triangles and a circle. That's a hard to draw a toothbrush <laughs> doing that. It's really hilarious. Very similar to like Dixit style games. Hmm. That's Artbox. Babylonia is the new Reiner Knizia game, which feels like a lot of his other games. In this game, you are placing wooden pieces on a board, trying to form big groups to surround ziggurats, to, to put farmers on spots. Many different ways to get points by forming groups mostly and chains across the board. It feels a little bit like Through the Desert, feels a little bit like Tigers and Euphrates, and a little bit like Blue Lagoon. Has some really nice pieces, although the trays do not hold them up. That's a crazy at how they missed that. But other than that, I thought this was a nice, fine, yet another game of this style from Reiner Knizia, Babylonia. Okay. Bloomtown has something to do with flowers and building a town. I'm not sure what the theme is exactly, but you're placing a tile on the board. Where you place that tile will let chooses which tile you'll draw next, and then you just score points. It's a little bit like Quadropolis. As you put a tile down, if it's a certain type of building, it scores points if it's next to other buildings or for buildings in the same row, stuff like that. But a very nice little filler. I enjoyed it. Pretty artwork, and if there's flowers involved for some reason. Karn or Cairn, C-A-I-R-N, is a two-player game in which you have these shaman, and you need to either get them to your opponent's line or get them to surround an opponent's shaman on the board. And you do that by moving on a tile and then you flip the tile and your opponent can move on what's on the other side of that tile. It has some similarities to Onitama, mm. uh, but it has really cool plastic figures and a little bit more randomness maybe in the different things that come up, but I think a lot of people will like it. That's Karn. Is it not about stacking rocks? It is not. Oh, okay. Um, I think there might be a rock theme in the game. I don't know. Gotcha. Decalco. This is a new game from Baobab, um, f uh, from Korea. This is a fun party game in which you stick uh, these pictures in a transparency and then you trace them as fast as you can. And, it, and when you feel like you're done finished with the picture tracing it, you grab a number from the middle of the table. You then cover up the picture and just put the transparency in the middle and people have to guess what it is. If they <laughs> guess correctly, you get the, the number that you grab. So you grab four first, then three, two, one. You also get a point if you correctly, or two points if you correctly guess someone else's picture. Hmm. It's great fun, especially if you can't draw. Agizia, <laughs> this is the second edition of Agizia, something about Rising Sands, or I think. Shifting Sands, yeah. Shifting Sands, yes, Shifting Sands. I've never played the original Agizia. I think you have. Yes. Yes, so this is, from what I understand, very similar. You're placing boats, worker placement, boats down a river, but you can only place farther down the river than you placed before. Some boats will give you cards that give you special abilities, points, or crops that give you food because you have to feed your people, as always, or rock that lets you build different things. And then you also go to places to build the pyramid, to build obelisks, to build different things. You get points in various ways. It is an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous game. And I really like the idea of placing the workers down the river. Solid game, Agizia, Shifting Sands. Nope. Did you play uh, just the standard version where everything is just pre-printed on the board, or did you play the version where you, you draw a different arrangement of stuff all the way down no, that's the river? Actually, that's actually in the game now. Okay. You, you use the stuff printed on the board, and then you replace the printed ones with the, the different tiles for the second round, and so on and so forth. Oh, cool. Um, House Flippers. This is a speed game. You'll hate it or love it. I like it a lot. It's a game in which you have a timer. You put that timer down. When it runs out, you get a cube of that color. And then you can use that cube to buy a card. That card will give you a cube, which you could use to buy another cube. Every time you flip your timer, you get another cube. Some cards, when you buy them, give you another timer. And you eventually get to these cards that give you points. And you get, I mean, not points, but you get a certain number of cards from the final level and you win the game. It is speed and flipping timers. I like it. Okay. It's from Sit Down. This is the kind of game they make. Also from Sit Down, Magic Maze on Mars. Yes. I think this one kills Magic Maze. 
Um, really? It's Magic Maze is a cooperative game in which you're trying to move some people around. You, but only you, Eric can move them right. I can move them left. Someone else can move them up and down. In this one, you have colors and there's pathways on Mars, and you can only move on the pathways of your color. You also produce resources, and so you produce a resource of your color, and then everyone's trying to move it to get it to certain points. I think it flows better. It's a little smoother in how it works, and yet it still has that craziness because you cannot talk while you're playing this game. So are you moving individuals, or are you producing those resources, and then the resources are moving around the world? Yeah, board? there's no individuals in this one. You're just moving resources. Well, there is an individual who shows up. Um, the uh, uh, After you build a dome, then you put a guy in a board, and they go live in that dome. So you just all move that person to the dome. Hmm. Okay, the next one. I think I might have spelled this one wrong. Maricara. Eric, you talked about this last episode. Is it Maricara? Uh, it's the one I from Quidditch Games that. that has the worker placement, and you can place them in the future. Oh, um, uh, golly. It's Terramara. Terramara. Oh, I can't even. I, I wasn't even close. Maricara? Shut up. Terramara. Uh, I started this game out. And halfway through the game, I said, this game is too stressful for me. It is a worker placement game, as Eric said. And yes. you can place workers on really awesome spots, and then you'll never see them for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. And also, if you have higher military than someone else, you can place in their spot. And if you're low military, you can't, which I thought was bleh if, you know, if you're behind. But as the game went by, I enjoyed it more and more. But I will say it's an extremely stressful, extremely in-your-face, direct confrontational worker placement game. It is yeah. very good, though. But whew, yeah. don't play with people who have thin skin. <laughs> Mirror City. This is a game from Korea in which you have to make a specific board configuration. And you do that by placing a mirror to mirror different parts of the board so it works. But the mirror can be bent in different ways. It's kind of a weird thing. You're trying to – is it just one-fourth of the board? You know, that will then – when you mirror it, it makes it look this way. And, or do I flip the board? Do I put these two boards together? It is crazy uh, difficult, I think. Maybe I'm just not good with mirrors. Hmm. Oh, Fox. I won't lie. I picked this because of the name. Uh, but it's a game in which one person is a fox or a badger or something, and everyone else is woodland animals. It's programmable movement. You move eight times over the course of the game. Everyone shows how they're moving, but everyone also has a special power that they can use when they move. And so... You don't know who everyone is, so you don't know which special powers got used. And the predator, the fox or the huh. badger, is trying to catch the other animals. They're trying to eat food and get to their homes. It's pretty clever. Hmm. Uh, it's actually pretty short. Paris New Eden. This is a dice placement game. Uh, it takes place in a dystopian future that we're kind of rebuilding from, you know, some the bombs. You're building Paris back up, and you're using dice to get workers and then using those workers to build up Paris again. It's kind of, you, you draft the die, you get the die, and you get to take the action of where you took the die from. A very solid game. I enjoyed it. Runestones. This is a deck building game of sorts from Queen Games, uh, which looks like all their other games. You're collecting these runestones or whatever. And sure. you play cards to buy other cards, or you can play cards for their actions. But whenever you do that, you always play two, and you lose one of them. Hmm. And so you, you lose the higher numbered one. So you're culling your deck. So you have to decide when's the best time to play cards and which two cards do you play together. Uh, Runestones is a really solid uh, game. I like the deck building aspect of it. I thought it was a smidge longer, but then it did kind of that it needed to be, but it kind of steamrolled to an end at the end. So I was pretty happy with that. Hmm. Skytopia. This is from the uh, Cosmo Drone Games. And Skytopia, you have these giant golems that are building cities. And this is definitely an engine-building game. Because on your turn, you place a die on the board. You can put that die any configuration you want. But based on a clock, each turn, you'll pull a die off the board. So let's say it's there's a clock there. So let's say on this, on this round, fives come off the board. So if I put a four on the board the round before, that's an expensive. I have to pay money to put that out. But if I put a six, that's not expensive because it's going to take a while before the clock clicks around to sixes coming off again. It's a little harder to explain on, on air. Watch my video. I'll explain it better there. Hmm. Um, 
but I really like it. Then you get these cards, so when you place a die on a card, you get to use the action of that card. When you get the card, you get to use the action of that card and every color card you've already taken of that kind. So you get some really cool combos back and forth. Mm. That's cool. That's different from what I thought it would be because you wrote down Skype-topia, which I thought was a game about like long-distance video communication. You're right. Okay. The Menace Among Us <laughs> is from uh, Smirk and Dagger. It's definitely in the dagger type. This is like a short Battlestar Galactica. Everyone's on a ship together. You're all different aliens. You're all throwing cards in, trying to solve problems each turn and uh, if or use your special abilities. At, after a certain point, you suspect someone is bad because they definitely are. Probably one or two people are bad. And you might try to eliminate them from the game. It's not a very long game, so it's not a big deal. And they can still cause havoc even after they're dead. I okay. like it because it gives me the same idea of Battlestar Galactica, but it's a lot shorter. All and right. finally, Vinyl. Vinyl's a game about records. In fact, the cards in this game look like record covers. And you're just trying to collect different, well, what do they call them now? They're not called records. LPs? Sure. So, whatever. Vinyl. Well, that's the name of the game. Yeah. Did anyone call them Vinyl when we were kids? Uh, we just called them records. Yeah, me too. Anyway. Yeah. I, Aren't there a bunch like the... of expansions for this of different like genres and stuff? Sure. Not only are the expansions different genres, they also change how the game is played. I like that. It's a nice worker placement game where you place the workers and you get them. But the coolest part of the game is just how strong the theme is. The records actually look – they're all made up, but they look like real record covers. Um, cool. It's one of those times where bad artwork can help you. <laughs> so if you're looking for a nice worker placement set collection game vinyl will do it for you and that's 18 games in 12 minutes 47 seconds Not 48. <laughs> they're all good Check not bad I, I think you win i did what do i get and i helped uh we get to move on to questions i'm getting key lime pie that's the correct answer <laughs> I don't know if it's worth worrying about, Tom, but that whole, like, your volume jumps up for five seconds, it's doing that again. This is a new computer. I don't know. All right. I, I have no idea. Continuing on, uh, which do you want to, who, who's going first? You can go first. So Dave has a question for us. Uh, define the qualities that make a game a party game. This is a trap, Eric. I know it is a trap because I can see where he's going with this. But I, I think you could read the question. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I think of a party game as, as, you know, a game. Well, one a game you'd play at a party with a large ish group of people, uh, usually boisterous very simple rules and and something that you can uh, you know just have a good time with without worrying too much about who wins gut instinct is my answer gut instinct C covers more bases there you go <laughs> uh, so after we've answered that question his second question is why is letter jam a party game in episode 622, he's going to bring out evidence now, Tom introduced Letter Jam <laughs> as a mind-twisting bender before Eric called it a party game, before later also calling it a mind-bending. And at the end of the review, Tom also calls it a party game. Surely these terms are contradictory. Another cooperative word game, Just One, does evoke a fun atmosphere. Quick team-based word games like Taboo do too, but more puzzly word games like Decrypto and Codenames do not. Yet people still insist on calling these party games. Is it just because they take a high player count? So are Seven Wonders, Ink and Gold, and Empires party games? Having played Letter Jam, there was a lot of thinking, puzzling, and quiet. No partying. For me, a party game is one that evokes laughter and banter, in which the experience of playing is as much the source of enjoyment than the results. Concept, Time's Up, and Telestrations are party games. Letter Jam does not sit with them in that category. Explain yourself, Tom. It doesn't actually say that, but all right. Uh, it was implied. You know, you're probably technically correct. It's probably a word game. Yes, right. I do think there's a, a tendency to lump word games in with party games, especially like team-based word games or creative-style word games as party games. And I think that's where this trap is. Sure, code names could be very quiet and thinky too, and I call that a party game. 
I think it's because party game and um, game shows are kind of conflated. And there's a mm. lot of thinky game shows, right? But it's still a game show. I don't really have a good reason for it. When you see my top 10 party games of the year, I'm not changing it. Letter Jam may or may not be on it. It has nothing to do with this question. <laughs> Well, I mean, let's boil it down to to the basic uh, granularity. Is Password a party game? Well, see, I could, according to his definition, it would not be. And I could, if someone argued with me about it, I would sit there quietly and probably allow them to have that viewpoint because I couldn't argue that strongly for it. Yeah, uh, but it is a game that say say you had a couple over for dinner for a dinner party. You could pull out Password as a parlor style Yeah, but if I had a couple over for dinner, I could also play Ticket to Ride. That's true. Yeah, I understand well, I, your I point, think... Dave. I'm still no. going to call it a party game. <laughs> this trap does seem to be unique to word games, though, for some reason. Sure. Greg, listen to our podcast with Best Games for Seven People and was surprised by our dislike of diplomacy. He says, I haven't played in years, but I have fond memories. All negotiation, no luck. Why the hate? Blood pressure. Yeah, I think that's what it is, Greg. It's <laughs> Diplomacy is a pretty clever game. It's all negotiation. There is no luck. You have to work with everybody else. However, for me, the problem with diplomacy is simply the length of the game. The first turn has a time limit of 30 minutes. After that, there are 15 minutes a pop. Not counting if you play online like Eric did, where it's days between hand. <laughs> and I don't mind games where you stab people in the back and stuff. And I was just talking earlier about Terramara, uh, a game that gave me stress because people were going to go exactly where I wanted to go with their workers, right? But that was also a two-hour game. When the game is seven hours, that stress is amplified for me. So I don't have time to play a seven-hour game and be stressed the whole time. I also don't want to play a seven-hour game where there's a small possibility that I will be – well, not a small, good possibility. I'll be eliminated halfway through. I was That's physically why. ill like the whole time I was playing that game. Yeah, because you don't trust anyone, right? And and not trusting anyone can be fun in a short period of time. But let's say I play Resistance, which has some similar feels. Like, I'm not sure who's on my side. When Resistance is done, I don't normally want to play another game because it's kind of worn me out a little. Diplomacy, you're still playing it. <laughs> yeah. Moses has been enjoying two rooms and a boom lately at family gatherings, but a rules controversy has come up. These gatherings generally bring, excluding the boring people that don't want to play, about eight <laughs> people. This is a low player count for two rooms and a boom, and games usually end in standoffs where both teams are just guessing whether the other will send the president bomber or not. My dad's solution was to institute this new rule. You can't tell other people who the other players are. Is this how you played? Is this how the game should be played? If not, what are your suggestions on how to fight these standoffs? And what are some suggestions for low player counts? I'd suggest oh, playing a different game. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, eight people seems almost too low, right, for two rooms and a boom? I have no idea. I haven't played two rooms and a boom. Okay, so in two rooms of a boom, you split everybody into two groups. They get sent into two different rooms or two different areas of the same room. And one person's the president and one person's the bomber. The, and everyone else is on one of those two teams, red or blue team. The one team wins if the bomber and the president are the, in the same room at the end of the game. The other team wins if the president is and uh, that they're in different rooms. And each round of the game, you can basically vote to send someone to the other room. Hmm. There's more to it than that. I would recommend, Moses, the game comes with like 600 billion different characters. I would use some other ones that are in there. I would not want to follow your dad's solution because if you can't tell people who other players are, then there's no point playing the game. That's a good chunk of the game. Like right. Day, it's, Eric's, it's that sort Eric's of negotiation and bluffing and yeah. I'm not as big on Two Rooms and a Boom as some people are. I like it fine. I think it's good, but it, 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 it does have a weird thing because how do you get information in a game? You can show your card to people. You can show just your color to somebody and not show them what your, your thing is. There's some weird stuff in it, and it really takes a talkative group to get it going. Hmm. But I agree with Eric. Play Resistance. 
Mike says it's clear that the two of you aren't really big war gamers. Are you kidding? I just Pretty talked clear. about Blitzkrieg. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's easy to understand why that's not the case for Eric. Not enough pickup and delivery. <laughs> but a lot of Tom's favorite games, Hero Escape Descent, Dual Vages, scratch that same itch for me. That's something like Combat Commander or ASL Starter Kit does. So what keeps you away from those, the theme, the production values, or the weirdly formal rule books? So the last two, yes, the production values <laughs> does not help. And yeah. the weirdly formal rule books, I hate. Um, but first of all, Hero Escape Super Lights. You can't even use that one as a war game. That's just really light. I just have I, I know the rules for that in my head right now. Mm -hmm. Even Descent, I know the rules for that. Duel of Ages is much more complex, and I can't explain why I like it so much other than I love the theme that much. But I just don't like looking up charts and looking up rules every time I play a game. And it's long, and then the pieces aren't that exciting. Then the theme, I get to move a few guys around. I don't know. I, will, I think Combat Commander is fine. I've played it. And, you know, it's just it's interesting you mentioned this because Chad Jensen just passed away, the designer of Combat Commander. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, so did the guy who designed ASL, you know. So uh, I think um, they're fine. I just that doesn't interest me that much. That that theme doesn't interest me as much. I, I actually like I played Blitzkrieg and it's fine because it's very abstracted. And these other games, it's a little bit more hits close to home. The war thing. I like mm. fantasy games because who cares? I killed, you know, some Dorko McDoofus. I don't know who that guy is. It's a made-up guy. <laughs> Dorko McDoofus? Yeah, well, he's from He's a uh, bard, Ireland. probably. <laughs> um, I think, it for me, it's the theme as well. It, it's it, war battle themes just typically don't interest me unless there's something mechanically that stands out like the undaunted game that uh, that we've talked about a few times that's got a deck building mechanism um, that that runs the engine of the game and so that one interests me a lot more than a straight up rolling dice war game. Nate uh, is bringing up episode 622 where Tom mentioned that yeah, we're getting copy like raked over the coals this time. I know this is that people have evidence and examples. Uh, Tom mentioned that copying the exact mechanics of a game and selling it is allowed and cited the ruling on a copyright case by uh, Da Vinci Games against Yoko Games for making a clone of the game Bang. Later in the same episode, there was a brief discussion regarding Glory to Rome, and Tom made another comment about how it would likely never get reprinted because of legality issues. I'm familiar with the Glory to Rome saga and how Carl Chudik, as co-designer to the game, doesn't own the full rights. And although he's made a couple of spiritual successors to the game, Motainai, Motainai and Ucronia, they don't exactly mimic the gameplay in Glory to Rome. In addition, there have been other games made in the same vein as Glory to Rome, like Import Export. However, not one company has come out with a game that exactly mimics the gameplay and mechanisms of Glory to Rome. Why not? If this is legally allowed, and most everyone is aware of the issues surrounding a Glory to Rome reprint, why wouldn't someone just make an exact mechanical copy and market this as an alternative to the Glory to Rome reprint? It would seem, with all of the buzz in the hobby around Glory to Rome and the secondary market price, that someone would stand to make a profit by doing so. And I know I personally wouldn't frown upon this just because I'm aware of the stipulations surrounding the reprint of the original game. No. <laughs> no, seriously, listen, okay. I think Carl Chudik, if he wanted to, could design Glory to Rome. I think the rights probably have reverted to him. And if not, I think they eventually will. Definitely he could do it probably and get away with it with no problem. He has chosen not to hmm. for whatever reason. Maybe there is things that he can't do. He's made games that are very similar to it. And yes, other games, import, export, is really similar to Glory to Rome. Um, so if you really, really want Glory to Rome, and I do want a copy, right? I want a copy for the Dice Tower Library. I want to put one in. I looked it mm. up online. I was like, wow, I can't afford that. That's just too expensive. Yeah. Mm. And then I thought, well, I could print one out. And then I shoved that thought back in my head. Yeah. Um, 
you, I mean, I guess you could. And I, I, I probably, if it's on a secondary market, I don't have a problem with someone printing something out on their own if they're not selling it or anything, if you can't get it anywhere else right. or mocking up a copy, I suppose. But I would not, as a publisher, do it. Yes, you can legally do it. This has been proven. Bang has been stolen by a Chinese company and they're selling it in very large quantities all over China. Hmm. And they were taken to court and the court said you can't really copyright game mechanism. So you could do it. However, if you try to do it in the English speaking language, I believe you would get raked over the coals pretty strongly. I think the backlash would be pretty heavy. Yeah, you would have to really be somebody willing to take a lot of heat. I would not be willing to take that heat. I would just say there's so many other good games out there. I'll find one that I can legally do or not even legally, but ethically do and feel better about it. Yeah, uh, it, it is interesting to think of the designer. If, if it is allowed to basically remake a game, if the, if the original designer remade the game that they didn't technically have the rights to reprint, but it was their game. I don't know. I, I, I think the that, company that went out of business, so I feel like he would have the rights to do it at this point. In this specific, most contracts, specific circumstance, yeah. Most contracts give you those rights back, I, I think. Uh, we are not lawyers, by the way. No. Uh, and we're supposed to say that, I guess. That's right. Whenever we're you not say lawyers, nothing thing. we say is even remotely legal advice. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's that's an interesting thought. Like, what does I guess the fact that they have an original contract, um, which may specifically say that they're not allowed to sell that design to someone else, and that might be a stronger legal protection than just some random publisher stealing a game. We continue getting raked over to coals by Matthew. He says, did you ever finish Rise of Queensdale or Detective a Modern Crime board game? You did a Miami Dice first impressions, but never followed up on them. If not, why? And what why? legacy or campaign games have you finished? <laughs> that, that's a very accusatory phrasing of that one. <laughs> okay, what, we'll start with the ones I have finished. have you finished, Tom? I finished Pandemic Season 1 and Season 2. Mm -hmm. I finished... Um, Clank Legacy, and I mm -hmm. finished uh, shoosh, that The King's Dilemma this year. I did that. Oh, one. okay. Yep. I did not finish Rise of Queensdale. I didn't even try to finish Detective Modern Crime Board Game. Hmm. Um, technically, I finished Seafall by randomly opening everything and looking at it <laughs> near the end. <laughs> okay. I did not finish Betrayal at House on the Hill. Uh, what else is there? Oh, I, I I finished Risk. Risk Legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel like that's all the Legacy games, right? Oh, oh, oh I finished Machi Color uh, Legacy. Charterstone? I, I finished Charterstone. I finished more yeah. than I not finished. Yeah. Okay, so here's why I didn't finish uh, Rise of Queensdale. Because I needed the same group together. But I also needed them to work on the dice tower. <laughs> we didn't have time for two hours of gameplay, and we were going to need to play it at least like 15 more times. I just didn't have that time for a game that did not get that much buzz. Mm. Detective, I just haven't had the desire to go through that one. It's a really cool game. There's a lot going on. but whew. And Z said he reviewed it, and I was like, all right, I got a lot of other games to go through. Okay. Eric, you haven't sold us which... Legacy games you finished? Uh, Risk Legacy, uh, Pandemic Season 1. I am stalled on Season 2. We, we talked about this a few weeks ago when a, a similar did. question came up. Um, I'm stalled on Season 2. I'm currently working through Machi Koro Legacy, although my kids are less... I, I, have to, I'm, I have to be the engine that pushes that one through. My kids have not been as receptive to it. Um, I think they just want to play other things and I, you know, this hasn't grabbed them quite as much, but I have enjoyed Machi Koro Legacy. And that's about it. I, I haven't even started Gloomhaven. Oh, Gloom yeah, I didn't finish Gloomhaven, but good night. That's a really long one, yeah. so. That's, that's a long one. Bill, last question. I know that you, now that you have a, let's start that over. 
Now that you have a game library for conventions, retreats, and events, how do you prepare the game before adding it to the collection for checkout? I assume you bag pieces, etc. But my real question is, do you sleeve the cards? If so, is it every game or just those with lots of cards? I would also be interested in any other tips or tricks you have in preparing games for the game library because I'm starting to make a small library for some small local events. All right, so I always use the Dice Tower containers now if I can because they're great. They not only store pieces in them, but you can open them up and it makes the game easier to play. I try mm -hmm. to think how – if does something in the game need to be laminated? I'll laminate it. I usually laminate a score pad because you're going to run out if you don't. Um, if it's a roll and write, definitely gets laminated. Yep. Uh, can any of the components be upgraded? That one's a little trickier. Maybe extra dice. That's an easy one to do. I do not often sleeve cards. I will normally sleeve cards if I think the game's going to get played a ton and or it has a few cards where a nick can really destroy the game. If, it, if that's the a, cards are supposed to be secret, that's important. Yes, that's a personal preference. I really dislike piles of sleeve cards. I don't like shuffling them. I don't like stacking them. I don't like playing with them. Mm. Uh, one thing I just started doing, I actually got some cards here on my desk um, that are the solo thing. I'm starting to yank those out of games, especially oh. nowadays. Huh? Er erasing the solo version from existence. Yes, but, okay, to be clear, solo players, that's fine. I'm not saying solo play is bad. It's just, just not that in this for library. <laughs> for a convention, it's not appropriate. You should it is confusing when you open up a box and you're trying to figure out the game and there's, like, a whole stack of cards that shouldn't be in this game unless you're right, playing Right, so it solves solo. two problems. I get rid of all those extra components from the game. And you should be going to a convention and playing a game solo. Now, I know someone's going to go, but I want to take it into a corner or to my room and learn to play the game and come back. Do that not at a convention. Someone else wants to play that game. Play it with them. Eh, okay. That's just the way it is. But, yeah, there's a lot of tips that I do, things like that. Put a sticker in and that says, stolen from your convention, because that way when someone buys it on eBay and says, was this stolen from you, Tom? You can say, yes, it was. <laughs> okay. No, did I not tell you that story? No. Yeah, so we've been wondering where Nemesis and Mechs vs. Minions was. Oh. They, they were gone. And we're like, well, when's the last time we saw them? Was the cruise, we think. I'm like, oh, well, we'll turn them up when we sort out the library completely. We sorted out the library completely. They weren't there. I was like, well, I don't know huh. where they are. So some guy emailed me and he said, I just bought Nemesis online. I was very excited about it. They opened the box. It said stolen from the dice tower. Was this stolen? And I said, wow. indeed it was. So he offered to send it back. No, there's no reason for that. Uh, we'll get another copy somehow and put it in the library. Not a big deal. It's not his fault. Um, I contacted the eBay seller who apparently lives in Miami. So they have a stellar reputation on eBay. Huh. And they told me they bought it from a yard sale. Now, I believe them for a couple reasons. One, they don't, they, like I said, they have a kind of a good reputation. Two, in their conversation with me, they said, we're sorry someone stole this from your store. Okay. So I feel like they don't know who I am. Yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. So this is my assumption. I don't think it was nefariously stolen. I don't actually, I try to, I try to not put nefarious reasons to things. I think... They got set aside on the cruise somehow, someplace, and somebody, another person on the cruise, or maybe someone, a, a crew member of the ship or somebody, grabbed them and then went home. They didn't know how to get rid of them, so they unloaded them at a yard sale, not realizing that they're both pretty, you know, expensive games. Yeah. And then the Weird. toy guy comes through and says, well, this is good. Yeah. Buys sure. them and flips them on eBay. Because I went and looked at the eBay one. And it had the uh, Max vs. Minions was by the same person. So I looked at it, and it had our library sticker on the back. And on the front, it had the weight of the game written. And <laughs> no one writes the weight of a game on the box because people are very precious with their boxes. 
But I said right. we were weighing everything. We were weighing the boxes, and Mech's first minions didn't fit in a box. And I said, I'm going to write the weight in a box because I think that's hilarious. And, you know, Kenny was like, no, don't write in a box. But it was too late. And now I'm glad I did. And that's why you should deface your games. Well, sure. Did, so did you uh, did you get the Mechs versus Minions game before it was sold to someone else? No, that one had been sold too, and I don't know who got that one. That person has not contacted me. However, That's Riot Games very nicely replaced our copy of Mechs vs. Minions for the library. Wow, that's very nice. I had to punch it uh, out. That's, that's fascinating. Actually, Be- because you <laughs> – no, no, that's uh, there isn't. Uh, that it's, it's sort of funny because you've written Stolen from Tom Vassell or Stolen from the Dice Tower on just about all of these games um, as sort of a joke. But this was actually stolen. Well, here's the problem. When we sell them off at like Dice Tower East, you know, we sell yeah. them for very low pricing, right? And, you know, it's it's not, uh, you know, I'm not going to like, hey, it says stolen from. I just assume it's not. I assume they <laughs> got it legitimately. Right. But if you buy a game off eBay and it says stolen from the Dice Tower, please contact me. Because we would like to track this down and figure out how they got taken. I'm not upset about it. It's it's silly. Yes, it's not good that people steal things, right? But it's also not the end of the world. So that's your <laughs> interesting CIS story. CIS Dice week. Tower. All right, let's get to that top ten. Saving. All right, folks. Who are watching on video. Let's see what else I got on my desk here that I can show you. I got a switch. Ooh. But I'll talk about Mandalorian. So I just watched episode four with my family. Don't worry, I'm not going to spoil anything. Although at this point, if you haven't been spoiled for one of the characters in Mandalorian, uh. then you're just not on the internet. Yeah, I feel like everybody's just spoiling everything. Well, I'm not too spoiled by it. I, I think I, I don't read. About, I, I watch the episodes. Like I watched to the, this was Friday's episode. I watched on Sunday. I'm not like that into Facebook and Twitter anyway, so not a big deal. But the the one character, which if you've watched it, you know which character I'm talking about, that was introduced at the end of episode one has brought our family together more to watch a show than any other character has ever in the history of shows. My five-year-old to my 44-year-old wife. Wait, she's not 44 yet. She will, she will be soon. It's okay, folks. She doesn't get upset about that. Um, they, they love that character equally. That's what I want for Christmas, actually. But I want, I want the real character. I'm uh, sure. It's hilarious. I'm enjoying The Mandalorian. It is solid Star Wars fun. It's family friendly. It's a good story. It's western. I don't know. I've I've enjoyed it from beginning to end. Oh, interesting. I didn't I didn't realize it was family friendly. I thought it was a darker um You know, I thought so too, right? I thought mm. it would be dark cuz that's the way the trailer made it look. And it's a little dark western style. There's shootouts and stuff, but it is it's, yeah, it's easy. My kids love it. Again, because of the one character. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it, uh, it's on the list, I guess. I've, I've resisted purchasing Disney Plus just because that would just be a whole other slate of shows that I don't have time to watch. Eric, they got DuckTales. Ooh. Both, both of them, I think. Uh-huh. And Gargoyles. I think you like Gargoyles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And they have the X-Men, the animated series. There's, Yeah, it's good stuff. It's good stuff. All right, let's get back to the yeah. show. All right, top 10 underrated games. Now, we've done this before, I think. So, for myself, I gave myself some guidelines. Okay. Because it's hard to pick, you know, what's underrated, what's not. Mm-hmm. So... I picked games on Board Game Geek. We talk about Board Game Geek a lot on our show. It's a huge website about board games where you can, you know, well, it's the biggest board board game website, and they rank all games. Yep. And so on that website, it's a big deal to be in the top 100. 
But honestly, if you're in the top thousand, you're doing pretty well. Sure. So I dropped into two thousand or less. So the games on my list had to be ranked two thousand or less. And I excluded games that are climbing in the ranks or new games. Like Sure. If a game just came out of S and I'm like, oh, it's only two thousand three hundred, it's that's not underrated because we don't know where it's gonna end up yet. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I did something similar, um, although I was going with a specific rating. I think I was aiming for stuff that was below a 6.5. Um, That's not too as, far off, I think. As an average, it's probably similar to, to where you ended up in the ranking. Um, and also that I had rated it at least two ticks above that, wherever the, the actual rating was. Sure, I picked games I just that I ranked fairly highly. I think I, it was an eight or higher for me. Yeah, but there actually Eric, is a, a way you can you can go to your profile on Board Game Geek and go to stats and and display your underrated games, the ones that you have rated significantly higher than everyone else on Board Game Geek. So what was your number against? You said six point five. That's what I was aiming for. Yeah. Oh well, then I I am more obscure than Eric because I am I'm jumping through the the numbers here. And at 2,000, it is 6.06. Ooh, okay. So I have so a So basically a, a tighter, 6 rating um, or below. Yeah. And we're, we're talking about doing something similar at, at PAX. I might have to do a significant amount of work to get my, uh, my I list don't together. think I don't think – I think I, – I think you'll be surprised, Eric. There's a lot of games that are ranked – we're going to do 3,000 and below – uh, there's a lot of games there. I was like, oh, yeah, I like that game. Fooey on Board Game Geek. Those people are wrong. Okay. So, So, by the way, the game that's ranked 2001, I don't think it's on my list. It is not. It's Brave Rats, which is actually quite a good game. Hmm. I don't know that one. It's a two-player game. It was originally called R or RR. R R. R. Right. R. Well, how about 2006? That's not on either one of our lists either. That's Gift Trap. Have you played that one? Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. That was, see what I'm, see, see what I'm talking wild. about? All right. Okay. Well, let's get started. Sure. My number 10 was going to be something else until I realized it was on Tom's list. And I said, you know what? That's a good choice, but not that good. So I'm going to make it number 10. <laughs> I just rolled better. My number 10, <laughs> speaking of dice, is first and goal. Now, sports games get short shrift anyway. And first and goal is going to get beat down a little bit more because football highlights just was released from Mike Fitzgerald, and that will probably become the football game of choice. But first and goal, extremely fun, dice-chucking game. You both, you and your opponent both play a card. You reveal them, and then based on who, what plays that you played in football, you roll a certain number of dice. Once you add in the teams, they release a ton of teams. It makes it super fun. I enjoy this one. This one's definitely lower on people's list, though, because, again, sports board games just never do very well. I would guess that in the top 2,000, excluding racing games, there might be two or three sport games. Not many at all. Hmm. So that's first and goal. First and goal, my number 10. My number nine is Seen It, uh, which I think might be a casualty of the, the DVD not being quite as popular That's a true. format. That's true. You can't play it, can you? Uh, I mean, you can't. You, without, without a DVD player, you can't play it. No, it, it comes with the is DVD. Is there something but... online to allow you to play it? That's a good question. It, it's more than just the clips. Um, it, 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 you actually have – it runs the question sequence. And, and yeah, I, it would be difficult without a DVD player to play this. Um, seen it is a trivia game. Uh, the original version was a movie base. There's also a TV and there's a Harry Potter and a Star Trek and a bunch of specialized versions of the game. Um, and, and it's a great party game. Um, you can play in teams and answer these questions. It had some very creative um, question types. Um, many involved watching clips of whatever it is you were talking about. Uh, just a good time. And uh, a lot of like, I think it probably has some some connection to some of the Jackbox party games that people play these days. Um, but but no one talks about it anymore, and there haven't been any new editions of Seen It in some time. It's my number nine. Yeah, you know what? Uh, somebody, if you're listening to the show, I love if you're at our forums on Facebook or Board Game Geek, if you could tell us 
if you can play this without the DVD because I just did a cursory search and I can't find anything. Yeah, my number I, I think it would be difficult. My number nine is a game probably most of you haven't even heard of. Rivet Wars Eastern Front. This is from, well, when it was called Cool Mini or Not. Now they're, come on. Uh, this is a two-player World War I chibi combat game. So it's a cute World War I with miniatures, and you just build them, run them at the opponent. If they die, you build more and go back until you accomplish different goals. I really liked it. It, it had some really cool features to it. It's very entertaining. It's quick and simple, and you probably can pick it up for a song at this point. In fact, I would argue that most of the games on my list, I'm looking at them, with a couple exceptions, are fairly inexpensive to find and buy. So that's Rivet Wars Eastern Front. My number eight is the 2016 uh, edition of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This is from Jasco Games. And I think that is where uh, its reputation sort of plummeted a little bit. Jasco, the previous game before they did Buffy was the Mega Man game. And that did not turn out as well as people had hoped. And I think people got a little burned on that. And, and I think seeing Buffy, a lot of folks went, nope. No, thank Just you. Just to clarify, that game was a dumpster fire. Eric's being too nice. We're talking about Mega Man? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so, But Buffy is a pretty solid cooperative game. You're trying to knock out the, the monsters of the week and save the populace of Sunnydale and, and work together with your, your various special abilities to eventually defeat the big bad uh, and, and uh, complete the scenario. And it's, it's, it's a good time. And there was an expansion at Gen Con this past year, but I don't hear people talking about Buffy very much at all. And I, I don't think that's deserved. That's why it's my number eight. Buffy, the 2016 Jasco game. My number eight is a game I talk about a lot, and I'm one of its few champions, and that's Duel of Ages. <laughs> yes, ranked fairly lowly, actually, and that's because it's just who's the game for? It has a rule exactly. set that's not as complex as ASL, but close. It has a really unique, acronistic theme where you have all these different people. There's a lot going on in this game, and I love it. It just fits together. <laughs> I would be hesitant to call this a great game. It's a great game for me, for sure, right? But uh, you'll notice I don't often bring this one out to play with other people because there's a lot of things to teach in it. But I like it a lot, and I think it got some short shrift because when it came out, this kind of game wasn't as popular. Had this game come out in this decade with the Kickstarter, which it would have been a Kickstarter, right? Mm, yeah. It would have probably done really well. Also, it would have had 600 miniatures. But <laughs> Yes. It would have. In fact, why don't you kickstart Duel of Ages? Brett Morrell, I know you're probably not listening to the show, but if you were, do it. Do it. <laughs> Duel of Ages you know, is my number eight. I so tried on this game. I, I got a copy in I'm a trade. I'm not trying to persuade you, Eric. I'm it, okay. I couldn't get past the sentient cave. I just couldn't. Like the theme, the initial blurb, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm just going to pass on this one. Anyway. Number seven, Myolica. Uh, this is a game about tile drafting that just sort of fell off the radar entirely. Um, it, this was, I think, my pick of Essen uh, last year. And uh, and it just it just disappeared. Um, I, I love it. Tile drafting and, and creating chains to, uh, to this get all those. A year. It's, not, it's a year old. It's a year old. But no one talks about it anymore. It just I think, didn't, Eric, I, I don't because think it landed it's a well little more obtuse people. than you and Jason said, gave it credit for. I don't think it's that easy to, to grok in your head. Well, I think that's part of the fun. That's fine, but that's probably why it's not doing so well. I'm not, again, I'm not knocking it necessarily. I think that's why right. it's not doing as well. I, I think more people should give it a try. My Yolik, number seven. <laughs> My number seven is Battleground Fantasy Warfare. Do you want a whole miniature game in your pocket? You can have it. You could buy a deck of cards. Each of the cards were miniatures, and it's like thousands and thousands of points. I love this. They kickstarted this recently, and I think it did okay. Um, it's I don't I don't actually know how well it did. It might not have done that well at all, actually. But I like the concept of this one a lot. I like miniature games. I just don't want to paint them and build them. The card thing works for me. And I like the fantasy back and forth. And it has some mm. good mechanisms. Like I said, you could probably pick this one up for pretty cheap. That's Battleground Fantasy Warfare. 
Number six is Burger Joint. It's a two-player mm, game from Rio Grande um, about drafting cubes uh, in order to create your engine of, of burger. Isn't one of the players pizza. a pizza player, though? Yeah, so one of you is it has pizzas and, and the other has um, has burgers. Yes. Um, and then you eventually upgrade them into better restaurants and diners and stuff. like you, all, you only start with the pizza and burger joints. But yeah, it should be burger and pizza joint. Anyway, you're you're drafting the cubes, uh, but the cubes mean different things to the two different players. Um, so you you your brown cube might be very important, but I it's not important to me except in taking it away from you. Um, and and this this drafting concept is very tense. There's a lot of tension in here, plus engine building, which I enjoy. Um, but it uh, again has sort of disappeared. Burger joint number six. My number six is the 10 days series, 10 mm. days in USA, 10 days in Africa. These are just being reprinted by, uh, by a company in, in uh, Tha uh, Taiwan, I believe. It is a great series, and these ones that are being reprinted are not really making the big waves, right? A lot of people, this was a pretty big game when it came out, but nowadays it barely is talked about. These are fantastic games. You want to give a game as a gift, you can teach mm. this to people really quickly. It teaches geography, and it's really fun. It's pretty close to um, Racco, right? It's that kind of game. Yep. I really like these. Uh, I believe the so far they've reprinted 10 days in the USA and 10 days in Europe, I think. Mm. Um, my favorite is actually Africa of the series, but that's because I knew the least about Africa, so it was neat to, to see the different countries there. Great mm -hmm. games, 10 days in the USA. Cool. My number five, I know why this one didn't do very well. Uh, not because only Because it's does, not a good game. Some people think it's too slow, but really what 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 has knocked Quicksilver down uh, is is its very, very boring cover art. Uh, I think folks looked at it and said, I don't even know what that is. It, it was just a very black uh, or, or it's a brown cover. Um, with the title of the game, and it doesn't show the Zeppelins shooting at each other and having races through fields of mines and, and avoiding turrets as they fly through buildings, which is what the game is actually about. And uh, I really enjoy the, the racing adventure of Quicksilver, number five. But I think we're going to see this on Eric's cover. next list. This one's ranked 9,656. <laughs> right, I, I know that one's coming. All righty. My number five is from Watsapoleg, and that's Jet Watsal Set. Pogue. Is it Watsapogue? Watsapogue. Who cares? No one can pronounce it. Speaking of which, have you seen their current game, A Kid in a Shuffle? Yeah. You know what the sequel to it's going to be called? No. It's another one about echidnas. It's a kid in a candy store. <laughs> ah, that's I thought that one. was pretty clever. Actually, it's a good one. Anyway, Jet Set is kind of funny because almost all the games that Watzel Peg makes are fairly light games. Jet Set is not light. It is like mm -hmm. a heavy ticket to ride. It's an economic game about building jet routes in Europe, and it's fantastic. If I go to a convention that's there, I might pull it off and teach it to some people because I know they probably haven't played it. And I find it to be very, very enjoyable. So my number five from Watzel Pogue, Jet Set. Very nice. Number four, Transamerica. Uh, we have talked about this a lot. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, I think this one got dismissed as being too simple, too straightforward. Well, this one's the, a the little weird, draw. Eric. Well, I can't say too much because my 10 days is very similar. Uh -huh. But at its height, Transamerica was by no means underrated. It definitely... It, it definitely... It it made a splash for sure. Um, yes. But uh, now it, it is virtually forgotten. Even despite new additions from both Rio Grande and other publishers, I guess there's a new one that includes a Japan map that's huh? only available in Japan. Anyway, um, it is a solid gateway game and, and uh, a, a lovely introduction to route building. And I think it deserves more praise. Transamerica and Trans Europa, number four. I've heard number four is coming back, asking Whoa. for troubles. This is a worker placement game with a lot of orange in it, but it's a <laughs> solid worker placement game with aliens, and you're collecting resources. You can chase these trouble aliens off your planet because they're basically a pain in the neck. They get in the lines at movie theaters and stuff. <sighs> and 
It's it's fun. It's it it works for kids, but families. It's a really good solid family game, and I I don't know. I just it's one of those games that I think a lot of people might bypass because it looks silly on the cover, but there's a lot of cool worker placement stuff going on in the game. It's simple and entertaining. I think you like this one too, Eric, right? Uh, I I do. My son likes it even more. He has brought this to conventions and taught it. Um, so yeah, he he really likes asking for troubles. Cool. Well, that is my number four. My number three used to be, I think, my absolute favorite game. Ent Decker: Exploring New Horizons. It's an exploration game. You're you're sort of doing a little bit of risk assessment, paying for the number of tiles you're going to flip, and you're hoping to sail off from one of the sides of the board and discover something useful. A, a uh, a, an island uh, that you can then claim a piece of and hopefully win the majority on so you score more points uh, at the end of, uh, of the scoring for that island. At the end, you have the lovely map picture of, of the whole board. I, I really like Ent Decker. Um, and uh, it's, it, it really has, it's, it is an older style game. It, it certainly shows its age in some ways, but, but it still, I think, is a, is a blast. Ent Decker, Exploring New Horizons, number three. I think Ant Decker shows its age a little. Yeah. My number three is Dominaire. Now, this was part of the line of games that AEG tried to make this whole big games where you saw the same characters in each game. Unfortunately, the, ga- the characters were like, the queen, the princess. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't really hold over that well. Mm-hmm. The only game from the line that has done extremely well has been Love Letter. Right. Dominaire, though, is a worker play. Now, it's an area control game, but each turn of the game, and there's seven turns, you play a card, and the cards get better. The longer you wait to play them, they get better, but you need to play some cards early. And you get to use cards multiple times. It's It can be analysis paralysis prone, where people take too long to take their turns, but there's just something about this game that I find fascinating. It just very rarely gets to the, the table. It doesn't look that interesting, but I think it's a lot of fun. That's Dominaire, D-O-M-I-N-A-R-E. Number two is a very simple pickup and deliver game known as Logistico. Tom really dislikes it, but I, I really think do. it's a terrific distilled pickup and deliver. Uh, the, it's um, it's a Kowali game, um, and and the production, well, well cute uh is not fantastic some of the cardstock was very thin and um the like the the plain meeple has no wings it's it's just sort of like a yeah it's a plane with no wings that you can put cubes on um it, it certainly works it's functional but it's not the prettiest production uh, ever and i i think it just it uh it fell out of favor um maybe some players got bad scores and then didn't didn't like it i don't know what happened um, but Logistico is a, a lovely distilled pickup and deliver game, and I think it deserves more love. And and this one literally is, if you go to Board Game Geek and look up Logistico and look at the different ratings and the comments that people have left, most of the highest uh, ratings for Logistico are my game group. It For whatever reason, we all love it, and then others just don't like it as much, and I don't I don't understand it. I think Logistico is fantastic. Do you want to see some Number low two. ratings of this? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you this, Eric. If I ever find a copy, if someone sends one in or I find it at a yard sale, I'll put it in the Dice Tower Library. Okay. I mean, because it, we years try ago, to have they games were... in the Dice Tower Library that are, you know, Eric can say, hey, person coming to a convention, would you like to play Logistico? I would love to play Logistico at a convention. Do you own it? I do. Of course. Well, you should donate your copy then. But it's mine. I, I like it. Let me ask you this. Do you ever play it outside of one of the Dice Tower conventions? Uh, on occasion. That's that's probably not true. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My number two was Eric's number 10, and that's Xscape, which is spelled like escape, but with an X instead of an S. So it's E-X-C-A-P-E. Mm-hmm. This is Reiner Knizia, who says he never plays anyone else's games. Watched someone playing Can't Stop <laughs> and was like, I can do that too. <laughs> I feel like that's what happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. And I actually like it better than Can't Stop. Escape is just a fun game. You roll dice. You get a weird number with the dice because one of the dice has a seven on it. Yep. And so I might roll 73. And then I have to decide how many spaces I want to move. I can move one, two, three, or five, four or five. But if I pick a, a number of spaces and someone goes under me with a higher number, 
then yep. I don't move at all. Yep. So 76 is the highest number. I always play actually with double X's because you can keep re-rolling, but if you roll X's, if you roll an X, you bomb out. Right. But I always play with the alternate roll that if you roll double X's and you go to the very top, so there's always a chance to shoot the moon in a sense. Right. Well, it's double X's on the first roll. Yeah, but we play double X's on any roll. What? It's not that big of a difference. It's a one out of 36 what? chance. It makes the game exciting. Sure. Anyway, it's a super fun game, though, and it has really nice components for coming out like 15 years ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think the last time this hit the table, we talked about it on the show, and I, I couldn't figure out why this one hadn't come back. Why has no one grabbed this and reprinted it? It seems like a, a no-brainer. It seems like a stronghold it, game, doesn't it? It, it, it really does. Uh, it's even that size box, I think, in the, in the version I've got. So it's 1998. That's 20 years old. I'm looking. Yeah. It's only been, I don't think it's ever been published in America. It has Amigo, Philosophia, and Giachi. That's it. Really? Oh, interesting. Yeah. I wonder, maybe, on, maybe Canizia is holding on to it for some reason. I don't know. Hmm. All right. So we, t I know, we talked about uh, the, the ability of Board Game Geek to. Oh, I apologize for how boring you... the show's about to get. <laughs> tell you what your biggest discrepancy is between uh, the average on Board Game Geek and what you have said. And top of the list for me is Merchant of Venus. I know Eric is just sticking his favorite game on the list once again. But for whatever reason, this one pushes all my buttons. I love it. And it. It hasn't worked for and so it hasn't worked for some of the Dice Tower contributors as well uh, that I've played it with. But most of the people I played this with at conventions I, are converts, I believe, when no, they walk I away think, from the table. I, I think they're converts Maybe they just to don't your enthusiasm. No, no, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I think if you love a game, of course, hopefully the people playing with you will like it at least a little. Sure. Anyway, Same. it's Merchant of Venus. Uh, I am disappointed that the reprint from Fantasy Flight did not take off. Uh, it appears to be out of print with no plans for a re-reprint. Re re um, and and I, we didn't get new content or expansions or you know further revisions or anything. And it's now dead in the water again. And I find that disappointing. I don't know why? I mean, I might know why. Anyway. No, I mean, of Venus. I wouldn't be surprised, Eric, like in five years, someone reprints it. I, it's a, yes. Well, actually, I, actually I might be surprised because getting a hold of Richard Hamblin's pretty hard. I believe it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, figuring out who owns it. Maybe one of the Avalon Hill or Hasbro uh, contingents might give it a whirl, but I, I'm not holding out hope. I'm going to hang on to my copies. All right, my number one is a game that I would love to see reprinted, and that is Magical Athlete. This mm. is a game that I am trying to win the world over one game at a time. <laughs> it's such a stupid game, and I love it. You roll a it die, is. move people around the board. First one to the end wins, but everyone has special abilities, and that's what that's it. That's it, and it's so dumb, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have enjoyed this tremendously. Um, I, not enough to put it on the list, I guess, but um, it, is a, it is a lovely game, and it's stupid. All right, let's see what the, the people's uh, choice list is here. Not now, this a lot one, of they... crossover here. Huh? Not a lot of crossover on their list and our lists. Well, sure, but I mean, this is one of those times where I did not, I did not expect that to happen because I, I didn't give anyone criteria, <laughs> but I also think the list is very good for the people's choice. So number 10 Lancaster, a solid worker placement game from queen games. Number nine run fighter die because Sam Healy has been promoting this game forever. This zombie game rolling dice. <laughs> number eight a game. I thought, yes, that's Elysium. This is a really, have you played Elysium? Yes. I think just once or twice though. Yeah. It's a neat game though, where you, are c collecting p pillars to get these people and then send them off on their final journey to score points. But before you, that you do that, you can use your special abilities. Number seven, Viva Java. I like the dice game. The board game's not as much of a winner for me. Mm. Six is Bonanza. 
I would say Bonanza has had its day in the sun, though. When Eric and I first got in a hobby, everyone and their brother and sister played Bonanza. Yes, indeed. Five is Vinhos. Uh, this is, is this a Lacerda game? I don't know. Well, I know Might it's be. a big, heavy game about winemaking. Four mm-hmm. is Ghost Stories. This is, well, just was reprinted last Bastion. Yes, last so, Bastion. So, uh, yeah, this is a great game. Don't get me wrong. I don't know if it's undervalued or not. Three is Abyss. This one has dropped off the face of the earth, and it's a really good one. I just played the card game version of this, which I liked, but it wasn't yep. as good as the board game. Okay. Two is Deus. This game, I know why this one's not popular, because it doesn't look that good. It's a uh, great yeah, game yeah. of basically getting these god powers and just colluding them on top of each other, and you know you can make some little cool combos, but it looks really boring. And number one mm-hmm. is Euphoria. You know why that's undervalued? Because it's not as popular as Jamie Stegmeier's other games. <laughs> it's, uh-huh. it's not Scythe, and it's not uh, Viticulture, and Wingspan, and Tapestry. It's the yeah. redheaded stepchild, and it's still really popular. So, <laughs> yeah. They, although I think you know, I think I've played most of Stonemeyer's other games. Euphoria, I have not played. Well, there you go. All right, folks. Well, that's it. That was fun. I liked going over those lists. Yeah. And thanks for coming along for the episode. If you're at PAX, we'll see you there. Uh, PAX Yippee. unplugged, anyway. And if not. We'll be back in a couple weeks with another podcast. And, of course, the video show, always going on, always stuff to listen to. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower.